Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy May Day. I'm Chris Revelo. I'm the Senior Director of Communications here at the Buck Institute. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second in our series of Live Better Longer seminars. So today, we're gonna to talk about space medicine, and we're gonna find out what outer space can teach us about the aging process. Couple of quick housekeeping notes, if you haven't already done it, please put your phones on silent, that would be great. And also the um, fire marshal is always appreciative when I point out the emergency exits which are at the back of the room. So, uh, question, how many of you are new to the buck? Who's here for the first time? That's great, welcome. We love having new people in the house. So, I wanna catch everybody up to speed on what happens here at the Buck. So, I'm gonna ask Joran in our tech booth to play a short video for you. The Buck Institute is interested in understanding age, not only to make us live longer, but to actually alleviate and suppress the development of disease. Chronic disease is the great health challenge of our time. Aging is the main driver of chronic disease. To eliminate chronic disease, we must harness the biology of aging so we can live healthy longer. The Buck Institute is the world's first research organization dedicated solely to the biology of aging. We work with the building blocks of biology to understand how we age. The buck is concentrating on really trying to go to the root of the problem, so understanding that we can sort of intervene really early. The Buck Institute is probably the best place in the world to be working on aging because there's so many different aspects of aging that are being studied. It's key because no one lab can do it all. Our scientific explorers are brilliant, curious, and committed. The idea that you could actually develop drugs that slow down the aging process was really something that 20 or 30 years ago, people thought this cannot be done. Not only can it be done, but we will do it. The pieces are in place. and we are in a unique position to put them together. Our world is defined by paradigm shifts, created by scientific discoveries. The biology of aging is the next frontier. We're working toward a world where healthcare is better. It's a world where if we can eradicate the aging component to disease, we're all going to live healthier and longer. It's just an incredible vision that really will you know, surpass anything else that we've ever seen before. We are inviting you to a future of aging without illness. It's happening today, and it's happening here. Join us. Before we get into today's program, I want to make sure everybody's got their note cards if they want to ask questions. Um, a volunteer will come around and pick them up. You can ask questions at any point during today's uh, event, so just raise your hand with your card. Special welcome to those of you who are on Zoom. You too can ask questions. Just go in the Q&A box on Zoom and uh, type in your questions, and I'll have somebody bring them up to me. So. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Buck Associate Professor David Furman. So David is a busy guy. In addition to running his own lab here at the Buck and making sure we're all up on the latest possibilities with artificial intelligence, he also directs the 1000 Immunones Project at Stanford School of Medicine. He has expanded his research portfolio to include space medicine, which we will talk about today. Dr. Furman is a citizen of the world. 
He's a native of Chile. He got his PhD in immunology from the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina. He's also worked at the University of Bordeaux in France and at the Sidra Medical Research Center in Doha, Qatar. I may ask him about his frequent flyer miles during today's Q&A. David, come up, let's talk. I get the clicker today, pretty exciting, okay. So David, first off, let's set the stage. How has space research done good things for us here on planet Earth? Um, well, one of the things that I would like to say first is thank you so much for sure. inviting me <laughs> to uh, this wonderful um, event. And it's a pleasure to have this full house here. And I know there's a lot of people uh, on Zoom. Um, for a long time, uh, research in space has translated into discoveries for um, Earth, quality of life. Um, things are, go from information technology, satellites, our cell phones, uh, very important uh, solar panels, uh, Velcro, uh, baby formula, the, the list goes on and on. And um, not only this improves our day-to-day -day lives, but also we're discovering new things that can impact our human um, health uh, in the future. So, uh, you know, in a nutshell, what we're doing um, as part of the research I, I am developing here at the Buck and elsewhere is to use the discoveries of uh, NASA and the International Space Station uh, research that is done there, including the European Space Agency, um, for us to leverage the type of um, research that is done there and hopefully be able to bring all those discoveries in health and medicine here at the Buck for a healthy lifespan. So when David and I were talking about slides about what, what's been the benefits of space, I mentioned Tang. How many of you here are old <laughs> enough to remember Tang, right? Well, actually, Tang was not invented by NASA. Oh, no. <laughs> well, it was inv invented by General Foods in the late 50s. But NASA discovered it and they licensed it because they found that this powder that uh, can be um, you know, very good for spacing, uh, uh, avoiding you know, lots of space, and, and it has a long uh, life, uh, you know, shell life. And so, uh, but it was, it was definitely uh, an interesting, uh, I think most of you know Tang or remember, remember Tang. Um, but yeah, so smoke detectors, the list goes on and on, baby formula. And, and today we're looking at accelerated aging, and I'm going to allude to that in a moment. Yep. So, whoops, I want to press the wrong button here. So before we go further, I want to give David a chance to talk about, how did you get into this? Yeah, so it was in the middle of the pandemic, uh, and Susie Sanello, shown in the slide, uh, reached out to me. She worked uh, at the Human Research Program in Houston, the NASA, uh, the agency. And she told me, David, the research you're doing in the immune system and how that relates to aging is ideal for us to understand how astronauts suffer from accelerated aging in space. And there's a lot of risks associated with space flight. And that opened uh, a large number of opportunities within NASA. We got NASA grants together. Um, and we're working also with SpaceX, uh, Data, and uh, Susie, I, I really understood after two or three meetings that she was suffering from a terminal cancer. And uh, she really wanted to pass the torch uh, in the type of research that she was doing and developing countermeasures for space flight. So it's mostly focused on the health of our astronauts. And um, she passed away in, uh, the, um, in 2023. And, and, but, but I keep that, uh, in a way, that uh, passion and uh, mission in life to continue the research that she was doing and now pivot towards understanding aging on the ground. So before we talk about aging on the ground, so what the heck happens to those astronauts when they spend time in space? Right, so many of the things that we were discussing with Susie were around the immune system. 
the immune system goes completely awry in space. There is a reactivation of viruses that otherwise are latent in most of the population. There is inflammation, uh, similar to what you see in aging, the concept of inflammaging and the concept of immunosenescence. There is decline in the immune response um, in, in space. And uh, that seems to be the cause, the root cause of many other uh, conditions that happens in, 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 in space. So for example, uh, astronauts suffer from cardiovascular deconditioning. They have five-fold increase in developing cardiovascular disease in their life course. Uh, they have cognitive deterioration. They have muscle mass, loss of muscle, loss of bone uh, mass. And again, uh, reactivation of viruses. It's, it's really a, a hostile environment. Uh, but what happens is that this um, occurs at an accelerated pace, right? And so what you see in this slide is really um, a summary of most of the research that has been done in epidemiological studies. Epidemiological, you know, considering that we have a few astronauts in space, it's not um, you know, a large data set, but we've seen that the acceleration of aging processes, the physiological acceleration of of processes is about 30-fold, which means that for each year an astronaut spent in the International Space Station, they will age similar to 30 years on the ground. So, so it's, it's pretty dramatic. So, twin astronauts, uh, Mark and Scott Kelly. Uh, yeah. I think it was Scott that spent a year in space. Correct. He's now retired. His brother was already retired. So how, how are they part of this larger story? Yeah, so actually this is a really cool study. It was one of the first um, multi-omics studies uh, that were done in humans in space. And multi-omics is basically trying to analyze as many parameters as possible from blood, from feces, from skin, et cetera. And so these are uh, monozygotic twins. Uh, Scott was sent to the International Space Station. He spent a year there. It's one of the longest um, missions that uh, have ever been done. And Mark stayed on the ground. And what happens is, uh, to Scott, many things change. Huge amount of things change at the level of the proteins, genes, cellular responses that were quite worrisome for, for, you know, for, for most of us to, to see. Uh, now, when he got back to Earth, things tend to recover uh, for soft endpoints, we call them. So immune system recovers pretty fast. And it's natural. We have to react. The immune system has this adaptability. Um, but things like uh, cardiovascular hypertrophy, those things take really long time to recover and may never recover in, in some individuals. So we learn a lot from this study. But now we're looking at private sector right, taking over. Um, Axiom, SpaceX, which is which is great in a way, right? Because there's less limitations to get data and to get access to samples. And we have now a, a major paper that will be uh, published pretty soon and a whole package of papers in, in nature that will come up probably next uh, month or so. Yeah, I, wanna, I was gonna plug that, David just did it. So one of the advantages of coming to these events is you really get to be on the inside track of what's happening. So nature, and very, it's the top journal, and their affiliated journals. They're gonna do this huge packet, I think like 50 studies that are focused on all aspects of space travel. Um, it's gonna get a lot of press coverage. David was a co-author uh, on three of those papers. So uh, when that hits the news, you have bragging rights. <laughs> that that you got the you got the inside track on on what's happening. So let's talk about how you study microgravity and the effects of space in the lab. And also, I want to go actually. Let's go back to that. So on this on this, you said the opportunity. So I want you to talk about. The opportunity that yeah. comes from finding out all this bad stuff in space and how it might be good for us eventually 
and how you study it. Super. Um, so yes, going to space may accelerate aging, and that's very bad for astronauts. Um, but when I, I'm, I put up that, that slide on the opportunity, I think the fact that we have this accelerated aging gives us a window for us to study aging um, at an accelerated pace. We don't have to wait for 30 years until things um, happen or bad diseases uh, happen. And, and, and so we can have that very short window of time to study aging at an accelerated pace. I would actually claim that it's one of the best or the best model for human aging um, ever, right? We are here at the Buck and many other institutions looking at aging. We're focusing on worms, flies, um, and animals like mice, right? And, and that's great. There's a lot of basic research. But um, I believe studying humans will give us much more uh, translational power to develop drugs or maybe intervention, other interventions for aging in humans. So um, we envision a way to um, accelerate aging in cells and in different organoids. And organoids are um, accumulation of cells that you can have built in the lab that represent different organs of the body. So an organoid is around one to two millimeters in diameter and they represent the heart. They're actually beating. There's very small, um, you know, miniature hearts and miniature brains of three or four millimeters in diameter that you can actually teach. They, they learn. It, it's quite incredible. This whole field of organoid work is a completely separate seminar. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but, 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 but we use organoids and cells uh, from humans and we expose them to simulated microgravity. Okay, so we can do that on the ground, on, here on Earth. We actually have the lab, the facility here at the back. Um, we are about to buy the random positioning machine that's on the left-hand side. That was developed by the European Space Agency. It's really good because you can do high-throughput screening of compounds. You can have whole plates rotating, and this simulates microgravity. And the other one that I really like is the one that NASA designed, uh, the rotating wall bioreactor on, on, the, on the right hand side of the slide. And this, what happens is, uh, it, it's, a, it's a, basically a wall vessel that is rotating very slowly at the same speed that the cells fall. So this is basically simulated weightlessness. The cells are in free fall, constantly free fall. It's the same thing that you see in the International Space Station. And so we're using these two instruments to expose cells from humans and to accelerate the aging of those cells and organoids and to see what type of compounds can reverse that or can prevent that aging from happening. So we've developed models for accelerated aging here on the, um, at the buck. So those compounds that do good things in your gizmos might eventually find their way to us, right? That's exactly right. So the hope is because we're using human tissue and human organoids, uh, other types of specimens, what we're discovering also using untargeted approaches. So transcriptomics is the study of genes uh, that are expressed in these cells and organoids when we expose them to microgravity. Proteomics is the study of proteins that are expressed in this, or you know, upregulated or downregulated um, in, in response to microgravity. And most of what we see are signatures of aging, of the now 12 or 13 hallmarks of aging that have been discovered and, and, and described previously. We see acceleration in each one of these hallmarks of aging, and we're targeting uh, this. We actually spun out a company out of this um, here uh, with the Buck Institute as a spin-off of, of, um, of, of Buck. And um, we're basically using this um, system to see how individuals will age in the next five to 10 years. In 25 hours, do you have slides for that? The, um, or maybe not? Maybe not, we can okay. talk about it, yeah. Right, so when we expose cells to microgravity, in 24 hours, we have the equivalent of five years of aging, okay? It depends on the tissue. Um, cardiac cells are more um, sensitive, immune cells as well. 
and brain organoids are also pretty sensitive, about 10 years of accelerated aging. So we have a window for how an individual will age. And we're, initially, we wanted to discover different drugs for aging and related diseases. We have a model for cardiomyopathy, um, uh, which is a disease of the heart. We have a model for Parkinson's disease at the moment, and we have a model for immune dysfunction. So we're using tonsil organoids, same organoids that I referred to um, just now, um, but these are coming from tonsils, from human tonsils. And so we can offer this through different longevity clinics, uh, elite healthcare doctors. It's a, a quite expensive of a product. We're going to launch in uh, a, end of this year. I mean, uh, realistically, Q1 of 2025. I know things take usually longer. Um, but the idea is that we can offer individuals a window for accelerated aging and see which compounds will work for that person to avoid different hallmarks of aging from, from happening. In five years, not today. We're having this window for the future. And so the, the uh, ultimate goal is that we will be able to reconstruct a human in a dish. So all the organs um, that we're working with, the organoids, uh, now currently we have immune organoids, cardiac organoids, and neural organoids. But we will expand to muscle, skin, liver, you name it. And the idea is to have a representation, a physical twin in a dish that we will accelerate the aging process, see how those organs will age, and find solutions for it. We're actually screening different compounds to actually reverse those processes from happening. Pretty exciting, huh? <laughs> so we got one, one question so far, which I think is a good one. Does air travel also accelerate aging when people are up there in airplanes? Uh, we, we believe it doesn't. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, if it does, it doesn't come from radiation nor from gravitational changes, uh, but mostly from um, time, different time zones, and you, you have your circadian rhythm um, all shifted because of the time zone difference, so the jet lag, we call it. But, uh, but not from radiation. We're largely protected from radiation in what's called low Earth orbit. And there's the ma magnetosphere that protects us from radiation. So there's no, not an issue there, nor microgravity, because we're exposed to gravitational forces there. So um, the answer is... You're yeah, okay. We, we believe we're fine. Yeah. So... Or I, I tend to think we're fine. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I, I travel quite a lot. I can't stop traveling. So, you know, it's part of uh, my work. So anyway. <laughs> right. So um, let's go back to a little bit deeper dive into the biology. So talk about, in, in terms that we can all understand, yeah. some of those hallmarks of aging and, and what actually happens when we go up in space. Right, so what the slide shows here is the different hallmarks of aging that have been um, defined in, in the literature, right? There is altered intracellular communication, cellular senescence that, are, that is largely studied here at the Buck. Inflamm aging, which is my area of research for the most part, there are epigenetic changes, there's a loss of protostasis, and the list goes on and on. And so what we have seen, and there's this paper in Nature Communications that has been accepted, uh, we'll come out with a uh, Nature package, is that every single one of these hallmarks is accelerated in space. So we've seen in cells that they mount an inflammatory response in microgravity. We also see that in astronauts. Um, we have the data from Inspiration4. Inspiration4 is the latest mission that was by uh, SpaceX, where four crew members um, went into space, and we have all the data. And we have a really good correlation between what we see in the lab and what we see in space. And so inflammation aging, psh, 
goes um, to the skies. Um, cellular senescence, we see signs of cellular senescence, which is not a good thing to have. Uh, you know, accumulation of cellular senescence will drive more inflammation, and we believe that's the most important um, aspect that gets, gets dysregulated during aging. Um, we've also seen other things like mitochondrial dysfunction. You probably have heard of the mitochondria. It's one organelle within the cell that regulates metabolism. And, and that gets completely uh, you know, deranged uh, with, with space flight. Mitochondria falls apart. We believe it's because of the um, cytoskeleton. The cell has a, a, a skeleton of actin, certain protein, and when you unload the system, the cytoskeleton gets remodeled. The, uh, the mitochondria that I just alluded to is actually um, embedded in this cytoskeleton, and it falls apart. It generates reactive oxygen species, more inflammation, and more, more disruption in each one of these hallmarks of aging. So I've gotten a couple questions about, OK, low Earth gravity. What the heck for people who are thinking about going to Mars? I mean, all the focus, right, is on you know, getting people to Mars, getting people back to the moon to actually spend time there. What, what about that? Um, I mean, NASA has serious concerns. Um, Elon Musk is saying that we're going to get there pretty soon. Uh, he's changing the dates all the time. But um, <laughs> we're saying at least 2030, uh, it seems like uh, there are plans to go to Mars um, uh, and, and to the moon. Um, now, I think the big issue of those long flights and that go above and beyond LEO, I mentioned the low Earth orbit, is that you get huge amount of radiation. That is a completely different uh, model. Radiation is not just the radiation that we receive here on Earth. It's galactic rays. These are showers of particles that hit the cells in multiple ways. And you know, the, the, um, the, I guess one of the results, I don't want to just state it aloud, but is the risk of cancer because you're getting all sorts of mutations in your DNA. So we have serious concerns. Um, if we could improve the DNA da damage response, which is a natural response that the humans and, and other organisms have to cope with this DNA damage, to the extent that we can resist that kind of radiation, I think we'll be well posed to go there. Uh, microgravity is another issue. Um, we had this idea at the beginning when I started this at the company and, and, and the research here at the lab, is that we could also help astronauts uh, go to Mars and go to the moon. Um, but the market is so small. Right? So, <laughs> so, so, so we pivoted uh, in this accelerated aging model to help people here on Earth. Got it. So, um, Microgravity induces aging programs in isolated cells. We've talked about how it works in more complex tissues. So talk about how the work with the organoids, that, that's really going to help inform personalized medicine, right? Correct. Talked about yes, that. Yes, I love that. Um, so every one of us respond differently to aging. We age differently through different mechanisms. The 12 or 13 hallmarks of aging are more or less expressed in different individuals. I may suffer from inflammation and cellular senescence. My neighbor may suffer from altered intracellular communication, some other issues, right? And so because we have this window for how individuals will age in the next five years, we can see which mechanisms will affect that person. That's precision longevity. This is the ultimate uh, precision longevity tool that, that, there are, that there is out there. So personalized medicine is now called precision medicine. And the way um, it works, if we take blood from individuals, we don't need to take biopsies. When I say we're going to develop organoids, these organoids don't come from biopsies. I take blood. And from blood, there are techniques uh, in which we can use uh, cellular um, reprogramming, we call it, uh, 
um, and these are immune cells that are in blood, right? To derive neurons, to derive muscle cells, to derive other kinds of, of cells, and put them in an organoid, and then age that person in a dish, and develop countermeasures to avoid that aging from happening. And again, this could be inflammation, aging, it could be senescence, it could be other mechanisms that will affect people differently. So we have this precision, longevity, um, almost like a luxury product because it's quite expensive to do all this. Um, so anyway, so. So we got a question on Earth, women live longer than men. Can your work lend light on why this is? And do female astronauts age differently than male astronauts? And I'm assuming when we do the, the precision medicine, you're gonna have organoids from different genders, right? In those, yeah. in those, those plates. Yes, um, that's a, a great question and, and, and one of uh, a huge amount of interest from NIH. Um, uh, we don't have the data to answer that question. We have no clue why women will live longer uh, and we don't know um, how they respond to this aging stressor. There's not enough epidemiological data out there from astronauts and we don't have enough data in the lab either. So we're, you know, if we uh, have, let's say, I don't know, 10,000 samples from males and females, at that point in time, we'll be able to say why these women you know, and, and men uh, age differently, um, at least in response to this stressor, which is space. So I got an interesting question, which I, I don't know that you'll be able to answer, but you know, we've been talking about how um, microgravity is bad for us. Somebody wants to know if somebody was in heavy gravity, you know, like in a chamber where the gravity was more than we have in normal life, would that be good for us? Do, do we know? Um, we don't know, uh, but uh, we believe it will not be good for us. We have evolved in 1G, which is the gravitational forces that affects us at the moment. If we change that either down, you know, uh, to low, lower that gravitational force or increasing it, the end product is the same. We have accelerated aging because we have not been exposed to these differences in uh, gravitational forces throughout our, our life course. So I think um, the evolution tells us um, that 1G is the ideal um, gravitational force. If we go upper or lower than that, we'll, we'll suffer from derangements at different physiological levels. Well, it's kind of hard to breathe too, right? If you've got all this gravity like <laughs> pushing on. Well, it. not necessarily, <laughs> but yeah. So, um, yeah, so. So, uh, you already talked some about what happens with immune dysfunction in astronauts and in space. You're an immunologist. I know folks here are always like to get practical information about what they can do today. So talk more about what happens to the immune system, both in aging and in space. And do you have any advice for folks who wanna, <laughs> who wanna take care of their immune. And I wanna so, also say, so David's a PhD, he's not an MD. Whatever we talk about here today, please check with your doctor, but these, these guys have some good information. <laughs> so I actually did four years of med school, but uh, <laughs> I dropped out, it's uh, too boring. Um, I prefer to do the research. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, this is uh, a uh, very important question. I think that the immune system drives almost all diseases of aging. Uh, we've seen infiltration of immune cells in cardiac tissue, in plaques, that, in people that uh, have you know, suffer from heart disease. We've seen infiltration of immune cells in the brain. We've seen infiltration of immune cells every sing in every single um, organ of the body, and they're causing really um, a bystander negative effect in different uh, organs and systems. We also see inflammation. You probably all have heard the word inflammaging, and maybe, maybe not, but there's this uh, increase in systemic chronic inflammation with aging. And this is largely caused by the exposome. The exposome is the collection of uh, things that we're exposed to during our, our lifespan. So, uh, from biological um, triggers to chemical to physical triggers, all the stuff that we, have exp we are exposed to. 
Okay? And this causes accelerated aging. We believe it's largely due to a reactivation or, or, or um, uh, activation, overactivation of the immune system that causes inflammation. So what we've seen in astronauts is exactly that. We see increased viral reactivation I mentioned before. We see impaired NK, NK cell function. These are um, natural killer cells that naturally uh, are fighting different uh, bugs that we are exposed to. There's a decrease in the function of these cells. So astronauts are more prone to get infections and respond poorly to vaccination. And there's also, uh, as, 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 as mentioned there in the slide, elevated circulating IL-1. IL-1 is a one type of um, protein that circulates in the blood that you want to have in a very low quantity unless you're infected with a virus or something like that or, or bacteria, right? In this case, we see a constant elevation of this protein. And so there is um, a lack of immune response. It, it's counterintuitive. Because in a way, you have inflammation, and on the other hand, you have a lack of immune response. And the reason is you're saturating the system. You're constantly bombarding different immune cells with proteins that are inflammatory, and that's the way uh, the immune system gets uh, completely declined and unresponsive. And, and that happens in aging, and that happens during spaceflight. Um, so uh, you, you ask me for uh, maybe an advice here. I would summarize um, this as, as follows. Every single species that is put in a new environment will develop inflammation. We didn't evolve with electrical lights, sitting in a chair, breathing plastics. We're going to touch upon that in a moment. Um, and you know, eating the type of foods we eat today. So we are inflamed. 80% of people over 40 are more inflamed than they should be. And so tackling the exposome will largely reduce inflammation and be able to you know, extend health span and lifespan in the population at large. So in addition to healthy lifestyle choices, I did tee up this slide. So David is on a mission to uh, educate us about the danger of plastics and that exposome. So, so have at it, David. What are we looking at with this? <laughs> so so um, I've been studying the social and lifestyle determinants of inflammation for about 15 years now. And there's a variety of things in the exposome that affect human uh, you know, health. Uh, stress, you know, chronic stress, quality of sleep, um, our microbiome, healthy diet or poor diet, um, and, and pesticides. Pesticides are really bad um, in multiple ways that affect our physiology. And these are plastics. And probably one of the most dangerous things in that, that, uh, that we can encounter in this exposome is plastics. Um, so we're looking at different you know, plastic uh, containers here, but they come from every single thing that you actually had in your household. Uh, cosmetic products, uh, paint, uh, even clothes, polyester. Uh, and so you, you put the clothes in, in, a, in an automated, uh, the automatic uh, dryer, and you're producing microfibers of plastics. And there are microplastics um, that are these small, uh, maybe five millimeter in size or in 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 in, um, in size particles that are accumulating everywhere in the world, right? So uh, not just damaging our health, but the health of um, all the species that are living out there. Uh, so it, it's pretty scary. It's, they're accumulating in the most pristine areas of the planet, the Arctic, the Antarctic, even the t Tibet is full of nanoplastic and microplastics. It's pretty scary. Um, how do we, I can elaborate. How, how, well, how do we begin to avoid them? Is there a way to avoid them? Um, so I, well, the conversation is, you know, this is a whole um, world of, 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 of plastics. Um, so first of all, I should say that it's not just the degradation of plastic, it's also the leaching. So a, what is a plastic? Plastic is basically a resin, resin and a plasticizer. 
the resins are typically pretty hard uh, um, and not malleable. When you add a plasticizer like phylates, it becomes malleable and plastic. We thought in the early you know, 50s, we were great. Uh, we have plastics that are malleable, they're durable. Uh, we're now seeing that there's leaching from those plasticizers that resemble hormones. They're very similar to estradiol. And, and they're leaching into our foods and our water systems. And so we're exposed to phylates at large, and that's causing uh, hormonal disruption with a lot of endocrine issues in the population, higher risk of uh, cancer and uh, rep reproductive issues. Not just the phylates that leach from the plastics, but then um, when you have these microplastics that are degrading even more, they become nanoplastics. And nanoplastics, we are only now able to measure nanoplastics since this year. These are, these are very, very small, one or two, three nanometers, so a thousand times less than a millimeter in size. And the, the bad news is that they cross barriers. They, they cross the epithelial barrier that we have in our lungs. They cross the blood-brain barrier. They accumulate in our brain. There's this study in the New England Journal of Medicine by um, a group in Italy that showed that in uh, plaques from um, carotid arteries are full of micro and nanoplastics. And that is a predictor of stroke and cardiovascular events and death three years after they looked at this uh, quantity of um, nanoplastic and microplastics in, in our, um, our arteries. So, so it's, it's really sc scary, very scary. Um, there are a couple of things that I think um, are important to mention. We cannot do much for our planet. You know, it's, it's a, a small uh, audience here. Um, there are efforts, the uh, United Nations, um, uh, have now a committee, it's called the Intergovernmental um, Negotiation Committee, that started in 2022. And the goal is to eradicate plastics entirely in the whole world by 2040. Okay, so that's really good news, right? Uh, now, what's going on uh, is that the fourth uh, INC uh, uh, committee event uh, just happened a few days ago in Ottawa. 196 lobbyists <laughs> against 30 delegates. So good luck there, right? So we'll see what happens in the number fifth and, and how this evolves. The idea is to have a binding agreement across nations that, to eradicate the plastics uh, for once and for all. Um, We'll see what happens in Korea um, by the end of this year in the ICN, um, I INC 5. That's it, yeah. So we've got a couple, more than a couple questions about inflammation. Um, so how, how can you determine if you are experiencing inflammations? What are the signs? You know, like how do, how do you recognize that? And this is a great one. If I was your mother, what can we do to, to, what can we do to take to reduce inflammation, especially neurosenescence, inflammation mm. wow. in the brain? Yeah, those are um, important uh, <laughs> questions. Um, I actually always talk to my mom and dad about this. <laughs> Um, but so you asked me about plastics, how to avoid pa plastics in the first place, that's a biggie. Um, I think um, in January of this year, there's this group who I'm working with um, that developed a technique to measure nanoplastics. There's about a quarter million nanoplastic um, molecules in a, a bottle of water, in, in a plastic water, a quarter, 250,000 a nanoplastic uh, particles in, in one bottle of water. And so, you know, suggestion, don't ever, ever touch any of those things. <laughs> Try to avoid, uh, you know, but, but it's found everywhere. So uh, plastic containers, I would avoid plastic containers. I would avoid any kind of um, synthetic um, uh, clothing. Usually it's good to, you know, wear wool, linen, cotton, um, if you're wearing or you, know, you have already clothing that are polyester, 
Try to avoid using uh, automatic machines. So you air dry is much better because the, you don't generate the mi microplastics in the air. Um, I would also recommend you to uh, commute or walk or bike. Um, about 30% of the microplastics in the ocean come from tires, from the you know, <laughs> rubber tires in um, cars. And always take your, your bag uh, for grocery shopping or, or, or use your um, you know, um, paper bags, yeah. So is, is there, are there symptoms of, of inflammation? I yeah. always know like when I get yeah. super, if I get overtired or I don't get enough sleep, I kind of feel like I'm coming down with a cold. I don't quite get a cold. I mean, is that, is that a sign of inflammation? Like what, what are there? So yeah, so this is not the type of inflammation you see when you cut your finger. That's acute inflammation. That's the response to an infection. Very well known markers, it gets red, swollen, warm. That's a very different type of inflammation that you see during aging. Uh, it has almost nothing to do. Uh, okay, so um, there are no signs. It's silent. Um, signs could be obesity. We know that around 30% of the circulating um, inflammatory molecules come from adipocytes. So obesity could be a sign of inflammation. But you don't have a clear, you know, even the healthiest and you know, um, you, you see, fittest person that you can see here may be exposed to a lot of things that cause inflammation. What we have actually think. So my first company, I, I should say, maybe back up a little bit. In the um, 2007, when I arrived at the Stanford community, we had this idea to uh, reinvent the wheel as to how we study immunology. Instead of using animal models, we're going to study humans. We recruited a large cohort of a thousand people, studied everything under the sun except for hair, hair length, um, <laughs> and measured these things for about 15 years now. As part of that research came Edifice Health, which is a, a, my company, first company, that is commercializing a test for systemic chronic inflammation. There are no good markers out there, um, but this um, part of the thousand immunomes came uh, of the first test for systemic inflammation you can actually measure from your serum in your blood. And so there are all, you know, no, no, no standard ways to measure inflammation other than this te uh, technology that we have developed. And from that, uh, I know that first, and we got a question about that. What, did, what have you found out about the aging immu immune system from that work at Edifice Health and iAge? What, what have you found? Um, so the IH that uh, Chris is alluding to is, is, is um, what we call inflammatory age. It's basically this new metric for systemic chronic inflammation. We used untargeted approaches. We also applied machine learning to derive this new metric that measures inflammation in anyone here, right? So it's composed of around five proteins. We could reduce the number of proteins to only five. But the way people would age is also different, right? So it could be that um, my neighbor could have high levels of the first protein, I could have high levels of the second protein, and we would have the same inflammatory age. And so the interventions for those individuals will be different. Uh, the other very important one, and this is work in progress, um, I wanna just throw it out there. Um, we run a clinical trial in 750 people that were followed over seven months. And we took pictures from their uh, face and their scalp, and um, we collected a huge amount of information. I learned from the Thousand Immunos Project what not to do and what to do better, right? And so designed this study. And what we're finding now is that with a facial image, we are able to predict what happens in the blood. So this will be an ultra low cost technology that can be deployed anywhere in the world, somewhere with a smartphone. We call that the healthy selfie, <laughs> okay? And, and, and we're predicting organ aging and immune system aging based on a facial image of you, you know, photo using AI and machine learning methods. Pretty cool. So I wanna 
get back to this slide, space tourism. <laughs> Just say no, well, <laughs> at, at least for now. At so least for now, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I don't like to be pitching VCs to get funding. That's very boring, <laughs> it's terrible. I have to do it for my company. And uh, it's not that I like to spin out companies. I have companies because I strongly believe that with federal money, you cannot bring the basic science that we're doing to the, to the bedside. We need a company in the middle. It's the, from bench to company to bedside. And so that's really the only way you can raise a, a, lot, you know, a, a large amount of capital and bring this to the marketplace. So um, I have been asked this question many, many times because VCs have the opportunity to do this kind of thing, to go in space, at least for four or five minutes and feel that weightlessness. And I always say, not yet. <laughs> let, let, us, let us develop the countermeasures, measure how you will age, how you will respond to the stressor in the lab, and then you can take maybe some countermeasure before you go in space and enjoy that weightlessness that they're excited about. <laughs> we got questions about uh, where you get the cells and the blood that you're currently working on, and somebody wants to know if you've done your own cells. Have you looked at your own trajectory of aging? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, where to get the cells? So, so we get the cells from blood. We, we draw people's blood. Um, that's an easy way to get cells. Um, we can differentiate those cells into skin cells, neurons, um, muscle cells, etc. And so we, we don't actually do skin biopsies. Um, but the interesting part is, um, you know, the, the company that, that I started is called Cosmica. Um, we're raising capital at the moment, and there's a lot of interest from the industry. So we're in discussions with Roche. They're interested in neurodegeneration. We have a model for synucleopathy, which is Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. We're also talking to the largest companies in the cosmetic industry, right? Because they're giving us uh, skin samples and we can age those skin samples and see which compounds in their pipeline will work for the next product uh, in the marketplace. So there's a lot of excitement of this new industry of accelerated aging. Um, I have not done this to myself yet um, <laughs> because uh, I, uh, you know, we can do it, but there's all sorts of um, um, IRB regulatory issues that we have to go through, and we're in the process of having our own um, approval for IR IRB, and we'll be able to draw our own blood and do that here. But there's a you know, regulatory framework that um, basically prevents us from doing uh, things in our own blood. <laughs> so if, if you had a, a crystal ball, when do you think this is going to be the, this will trickle down to the general public? Like how long does it take for the kind of basic research that you're doing and then for it to get out? Do you have any sense of it? Yeah, so... Um, what we're doing here at the, at the Buck is informing a lot about aging mechanisms um, that will be translated you know, in the near future. We don't know exactly when. When I'm doing a company, which is very, obviously very similar because it was a spun um, spin-off of the Buck, is much more applicable to um, understanding that individual variation in aging. Okay, so we're gonna launch, as I mentioned before, our first product, uh, which is the blood aging in Q4 of this year, um, hopefully. Uh, realistically, it could be Q1 of next year. I mean, I've done it before. I know how that um, typically extends uh, the time to, to market. But so it's coming. It's coming pretty soon. We will be able to age the blood. Now, the older twin that I call it, in a dish, which is this physical representation of each one of your organs in, the, in, the, in, in a dish, um, it's going to be probably in 2027. Um, and how much of that will hit the masses? Very, 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 this much at first, right? So this is a luxury product that will be offered through longevity clinics. Because this is quite expensive as te a technology, it's going to be quite pricey. Um, but this is very typical. All, all, all these longevity interventions first go for the 
um, you know, wealthy individuals that can pay for it, and then as we are decreasing the cost of the technology, that can be applied to mo more people out there. Now think of the healthy selfie, right? This is something we can deploy anywhere in the world for free, and that's my goal. Okay, so millions of people could use it anywhere. It could be in Korea, in South America, in the Congo, someone with, with a smartphone. Okay, so I think uh, this gives you a rough estimate of your accelerated aging in the body. It's not perfect. If you want more uh, precise um, um, evaluation, you'll need to go and do a, a, a blood draw. So, Great. That's kind of all right. Idea. Much to look forward to. So I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank David for being here. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, too. So let me, let me tell you what's going to happen next. Probably tomorrow or the day after, you're going to get an email with a link to the video from today's event in case you want to look at it again. Um, we're also going to provide some links to content. Uh, in particular, I, I didn't mention this, a blog post just went up on our website that's all about plastics. So um, that will be included in the email, so you'll get some of David's uh, information and tips about plastics. Um, you will also get instructions for how to register for our next event. So on June 5th, I will be back here. I will be talking to Dr. Gordon Lithgow. Gordon is going to talk to us about basic research in aging involving tiny, tiny nematode worms. Now, you might think, what do tiny nematode worms have to do with me? Well, I'll tell you, those tiny nematode worms are the workhorse of research on aging. There have been many discoveries in those tiny worms that do have a relation to human health. So I encourage you to come. Gordon is great to talk to. You'll get, you'll get some good information. So if you are new to the buck, we please ask you to sign up for one of our public tours. They happen twice a week. They're great tours. You can do that on our website. You can also um, sign up for, um, you can listen to our new podcast. So we have a great podcast. We're not getting any younger yet. <laughs> it's getting great reviews. Our second season just posted. The, the latest podcast is with Walter Longo from Southern California. He is all about diet and longevity, a leader yeah. in the field. I, it's a good listen, and we have, we have other episodes on that podcast well, with, well worth your attention. Um, let's see. You can also sign up for our newsletter on our website. If you want to keep informed and know when uh, that big packet of studies is going to come out from nature, that newsletter will have that information. And um, finally, I just want to also very much encourage you to become a donor here at the Buck Institute. The donations here, philanthropy, makes a huge difference. We have projects, kind of, we call them uh, seed money for projects that are really experimental, that are looking at aging in new ways. And the, the philanthropy that we get helps fuel those discoveries. So I always ask people, please get in touch with your most generous self and, uh, and consider becoming a, a donor and partnering with us here at The Buck. So once again, thank you, thank you very much for coming. I will be here on June 5th, and I hope you'll be here too. <laughs>